So I, I can tell you how important zero one laws are to me because in America we have a car and in America you can buy a, a special license plate. They're called vanity plates with anything you want and on my car it says zero one. So that's, uh, that's it. So here we're going to play a game. Here's, here's a game. It's called uh, the Aaron Foyt game. It's a mathematician. Sometimes it's called Aaron Foyt Frasse game. Another French mathematician, Frasse. Aaron Foyt, I think, is Polish. I, 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 yeah, okay. So they're, they're graphs. G and H, and there's T rounds. So these are the parameters, and there are two players. Uh, spoiler and duplicator. And uh, so here's how the game is played. It's a perfect informa perfect information game. Here are the graphs G and, and H. Okay. So on the first round, each round, first the spoiler moves and then the duplicator moves. So first the spoiler picks a point on either G or H. They're, they're disjoint. They're disjoint. So spoiler picks a, a point on either G or H and he marks it with a 1. And then um, duplicator then goes to the other graph and also picks a point and marks it with a one. Okay. But it doesn't matter green or blue. I, I just write red or green. All right. Now the second round, spoiler goes to either graph and picks a point and marks it with a two. And now, oh, this is good. I have lots of colors here. And now duplicator must duplicate. Now, what does that mean? If there is an edge, let's assume there's an edge here from one to two, then duplicator must move. where there's an edge here. Well, maybe he can't do it, then he loses the game. Then he loses the game. And now I just show you the third round. Again, spoiler uh, take these out. Spoiler picks a point on either graph. Let us say here and perhaps three, and marks it three, and perhaps here one is ad adjacent to three, and two is not adjacent to three, then duplicator must pick a point three over here, and also have uh, three adjacent to one, and not three adjacent to two. That's what I mean by duplicator. And if, if duplicator can't do this, he loses. But the game does not go on forever. T is, is known. Everything is known. Perfect information. So we know the game is only going to take T rounds. And if duplicator keeps going for, ten, for T rounds, then duplicator wins. Otherwise, spoiler wins. OK, so is the game clear how to, how to play the game? Notice, G, it's not that G belongs to spoiler and H belongs to duplicator. The, the two graphs are like in the middle, and here's duplicator and here's spoiler. So they, and, and the real power is the spoiler chooses 
has the choice either to go in G or in H. It's his choice. Okay. Now here is the, so this will be a fun game and we'll, we'll play it a little bit. But here is the connection to logic. Theorem, duplicator wins Now, what do I mean by wins? It, it's a perfect information game, so with perfect play on both sides. If and only if G and H agree on all first order, I will define this, sentences of quantifier depth less than or equal to t. So this is the theorem for logic. I'll, I'll just give an example, but let, let me tell you what first order logic, what I mean by first order logic. In first order logic, we have uh, uh, Equality, we can say x equals y. We can say x is adjacent to y. I'll write x tilde y, x adjacent to y. We can say and, or, not, with the usual Boolean expressions. And we have existential and universal quantification. So we can say, for example, um, for all x there exists a y, such that x is adjacent to y. Because every point is adjacent to some other point. Very important, the quantification is only over vertices. It's not over sets. If you want it over sets, that's second order, and Andre will have to invite me back for another set of lectures. But, but here we only look at, at, at first order. So when I say for all x, I mean for all vertices x. Okay. And what does quantifier depth mean? You have quantifiers inside of other quantifiers. So if I write this, This whole sentence has quantifier depth two, not four, because this is inside this, but then this part is separate. So remember, it's not the number of quantifiers, but um, you think of quantifiers being inside other quantifiers, so that's the depth. Uh, let me uh, give a, an example of it. Suppose we consider this statement. A, for, that is every, X, every point has a neighbor, and suppose so this has quantifier depth uh, 2, and suppose that, that G has uh, A and This is not. And, and H satisfies not A. OK, so here is the strategy, the two move strategy for spoiler. OK, well, in G, every point has a neighbor. But in H, that's false. That means there is a point without a neighbor. So the spoiler. picks a point that has no neighbor. Then, duplicator picks some point, but every point here has a neighbor, so now spoiler goes over here and picks a neighbor, and duplicator loses, because the point on the right has no neighbor. And, and this is general. I mean, you can, you can write out any, this is just technical things with a logic. You can write out the first order statements in such a way 
that, that you can play the game. So this is very nice. We don't need to know any more logic. Now we forget about logic. All we do is we play games, which is nice because I, I'm not a logician. So all we need is this one theorem. And now if we know how to play games, then, um, then we can prove theorems in logic. Yeah. I was very proud. I once gave a talk to the Association of Symbolic Logic, the Mathematicians in Logic, which was wonderful because I, I, I never took a course in logic. OK. Let's, let's, play, a, let's play a game. So in particular, because of this, suppose that for every t, suppose g and h were infinite. I mean, suppose that for every t, duplicator could win the game. That's not the same as winning an infinite game. I'm saying for, because, t, so for arbitrary t, suppose for arbitrary t, duplicator can win the game, then G and H have exactly the same first order properties. I think the term is elementarily equivalent. They agree on every first order property. So here's, here's a nice example. With two infinite graphs, G is the doubly infinite path. And let H be two in doubly infinite paths. And the claim is two disjoint doubly infinite paths. Let T be given and uh, I want to show you how duplicator can win the game. So of course the first move, everything is symmetric, so it doesn't matter. And the first move, here's one, and, and I just mark them one and one, okay? But the problem is that now, I mean, if, of course, if, if if spoiler goes here, there's no problem. But suppose now that, suppose now that um, spoiler goes over here. So what happens is that duplicator plays way far away on, on G, plays way far away. But we have to make that precise. We have to make that precise. So, so let's see how we do it. This is a nice. Nice little exercise. Let's say that points x1 through xl are d equivalent to y1 through yl. So the x's are on g and the, the y's are on h. If whenever a pair is at distance L less than or equal to D, the corresponding pair is the same and for technical reasons and in the same direction. So while the direction isn't part of the, the structure, let's just give these a direction. So to say that two sets are 50 equivalent means if, if, if on G, the second point and the fifth point, the fifth point is 
23 to the right of the second point, then on H, the fifth point is 23 to the right of, 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 of there. So that's just a definition of equivalence. And now I can give the, uh, the duplicator strategy. Here's what he tries to do, that when their S moves remaining, he wants them to be de-equivalent with D equal 2 to the S plus 1 minus 1. Okay. Now we have to show that he can do this, that uh, he can do this. Uh, so first of all, if he does this, then with zero moves to remaining, uh, they, are, they are one equivalent, which means that if a pair is adjacent, then the corresponding pair is adjacent. So if, if he can do this, he will he will uh, win. So now we just have to show that, that he can follow this strategy. Uh, because remember that, that spoiler is an adversary. So uh, what happens, maybe I go over here. Can I, can I use these on here? OK. So let, let's suppose that, that uh, s equals 4. So there are four moves remaining. And uh, suppose that at that time, duplicator has succeeded. Of course, he succeeds in the first round. And even he succeeds in the second round, because he just moves the second point way, way far away. So suppose that with four moves remaining, it, it has this property. OK. Look at the points that are within um, uh, 31 of each other. So they form clusters. So in G, there'll be some kind of cluster like this, and maybe another cluster, and then maybe some isolated points in G. And then in H, you'll have exactly the same clusters. But of course, they may be in different places. So you'll have this cluster, and maybe the other cluster is, is down on the second line. And maybe this point is here, and this point is here. OK, so here we have four clusters. Inside the cluster, the point to the next point is less than or equal to 31. But uh, this distance here, between the clusters is, is greater than 31. OK, so that we're assuming that that's the situation. And, and now, spoiler makes a move. OK, well, maybe the move, so maybe the move is, is more than 15 away from every point. Well, it's an infinite graph. So duplicator just finds a point way, way far away and picks that point. But maybe the point is within 15 of one of the clusters. Then, suppose that, let me use the green. Suppose he played here, maybe at a distance 3 from this cluster. Then, duplicator looks at the same cluster 
and moves out the same distance three. Now the only problem could be, could the two clusters merge? And that's why it's two to the s. You see, these two are more than 31 apart. So the clusters are more than 31 apart. But on the next round, they only have to be, if they're more than 15 apart, they're in separate clusters. So you, he can't make a move that's attached to two clusters. So any move he makes is only attached to one cluster. And so you, you make the corresponding move. And that's the strategy. There's no probability yet. Where this is all. Um, so that's the strategy that works. And it has a strong implication. So because of this strategy, that means that, that these two graphs, G and H, have exactly the same first order properties. Any first order property you can write, it holds for G if and only if it holds for H. Now G, you look at this, you say, G, um, hmm, they don't look the same. G is connected. H is not connected. The conclusion is very powerful. The conclusion is that connectivity is not a first order statement. So it's a really powerful uh, conclusion. Uh, there are other ways to prove it, but, but this is the combinatorial way to prove it. That is, there is no first order sentence on graphs that tells you that the graph is connected, no matter what you try. You, you, this says you can't do it. You can't do it. There is no, it says that, that first order, that connectivity is not a first order property. So that, that, that's pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful. I mean, also you get similar things. OK, but Andre brought me here to do probability. So let's uh, now. Oops. Okay. So now let's look at random graphs. Okay. And for the moment, let G sub n be a random graph <laughs> on n vertices, by which I mean any distribution whatsoever. So the, the set of graphs on n vertices, they're two to the n choose two graphs. Take any, for the moment, later, of course, we'll look at GNP. But for the moment, just take any distribution at all on, on graphs uh, on, on n vertices. And we, we say that, that We say that this distribution, and really for each end there's a distribution, to be technical. Um, this distribution satisfies the 0, 1 law. It means the following. So this is a definition, 0, 1, I don't know why I'm, no way. Uh, this means uh, models, or that this means that A is true in the graph GN. 
So by a zero one law, what I mean is that for any first order statement, such as there exists a triangle, for all x there exists y, y adjacent to x, any for, for all x there exists a y such that for all z, blah, 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 any first order statement you, you write that you, for each n you have a distribution over a finite set, so there's a probability that A holds, and that this probability goes to a limit, and that the limit is 0 or 1. So this is called a 0, 1 law. We don't always have a 0, 1 law. We, we don't always have a 0, 1. For example, for example, take the random graph on n vertices with edge probability 1 over n, and consider the statement that there exists a triangle. As it happens, take the statement there doesn't exist the triangle. As it happens, the limiting probability is e to the minus one sixth. Okay, so that comes out of things in, in it comes from Erdős and Rainey, and uh, but the point is it's not zero or one. Okay, so then you don't have a zero one law for that distribution. But we'll be interested in when you do have a zero one law. And so what I want to say is that this holds if and only if take uh, M and N very large, actually for thinking about it, think of m equals n, though technically they're both going to infinity. Think of m equals n and take the random graph on m vertices and the random graph on n vertices. And let's see who wins the game. The players are not playing randomly. The players are playing perfectly. But the game that they are given to play on is random. So, with a certain probability, the duplicator wins, and with a certain probability, the spoiler wins. And T is the number of rounds. These are, in, even if M equals N, these are independent, independent choices. Okay. And to have a zero one law, it means that as m and n go to infinity, but think of m equals n. So you, you fix an arbitrary t, fix t equals five, you need that, that as n goes to infinity, you take a random graph on n vertices and another independent random graph on n vertices then with probability approaching one as n goes to infinity, duplicator wins the game. Very important, randomness on the graphs, not randomness on the play. The duplicator and spoiler play perfectly. And uh, this is not hard to prove, uh, but let me uh, 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 give you an idea. Um, suppose there was, ju just to give you an idea, uh, suppose there was a first order statement A that had limiting probability a half. Okay. Then let n go to, let n be large. You take the two random graphs, but with probability a half, but this A has, has quantifier depth t. So, so suppose, suppose there was a, fr a first order statement A, which had limiting probability a half, then take its quantifier depth T, take the two graphs with probability a half, one of them has A and the other does not have A, but then, but then spoiler wins. So spoiler would win with probability at least one half, which means that it would not be true that, that duplicator won with probability one. So that's just one part. One has to be, a, there's some more technical things, 
Uh, but, but this is if and only if. So if we want to show a zero one law, we just have to play games. All we have to do is play games. We and it combines, it just combines probability and combinatorics. We have these random structures, which can get complicated depending on the distribution. Let me mention one case, well, no, I mean, there are lots of distributions. Um, but you put down these random graphs, and if you can, we find a strategy for duplicator that wins with probability, Given t, t is arbitrary but fixed. Given t, if there's a strategy for duplicator that wins with probability approaching one, then there's a zero one law. If for all t, there's a strategy. All right, so now we come to a wonderful, wonderful theorem. Sometimes there are theorems that are important, and sometimes there are theorems that you just love. This is both. This is both. Okay. So it's due to uh, Glebsky. Usually I just say Glebsky et al., but and. Uh, Talinoff, um, but Andre says Talinoff is now retired and living somewhere. Uh, right. He uh, lives in uh, Nizhny Novgorod. Okay, okay. Yes. Well, he certainly proved a wonderful theorem. And unfortunately, this was in the bad old days of the Cold War, so the people in the West didn't know about this, so it was um, independently proved by. Ron Fagan, and let me tell you what the, the theorem is. Take the random graph uh, GNP, is that's the distribution, each pair is in with probability p, um, and p equals zero and p equals one are trivial cases, so we, we don't look at those. Um, and, and the theorem is that there's a zero one law, that there's a zero one law. So th all the p's look the same. So th think of p equals a half. So for any statement, like there exists a triangle, limiting probability one. For all x, there exists a y, y adjacent to x, limiting probability one. But the strength is for any first order statement, the limiting probability is, is either zero or one. So how do we prove this? Well, we just play games. We're gonna play the T-move Ehrenfoyt game where N and M are large. And all I have to do is give you a strategy for duplicator that works and then we're done. So I don't have to give you the best strategy, all I have to give you is a strategy that works with probability approaching one and that gives the zero one. Well, it turns out there's a very simple strategy, but first let me define the, the U extension. Let me, let me assume, I'm, I'm just gonna assume P is less than or equal to half, because otherwise you could work with the complement graph, so it, that, that's really, it's just a convenience. Um, so the U extension property, so here's a property of graphs, that every U points have all two to the U
extensions. So what do I mean by that? That, say, the 10 extension property, for every 10 points, you have 1,024 points with every possible adjacency to the 10 points. All right, that's just the definition. I haven't proven anything yet. Okay, but do we understand? This is a property of graphs, that for every 10 points, and we have, we're making 1,024 statements. There's a, there's a point adjacent to the first, the second, the seventh, and the ninth, and not to the others, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all 1,024. Okay, so that's called the, the U extent. So that's just the property of graphs. Maybe it holds, maybe it doesn't. But I need a little bit of, of a lemma. The probability that U extension fails, I want to say that that goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Well, We have at most n to the u choices for the u point. Actually, n choose u, but it won't matter. Think of them as ordered. We have n to the u, at most n to the u choices for the u points. Then we have 2 to the u, but that's just a constant. We have 2 to the u. And so now here's our u points. And what we want is a witness. We call it a witness. We want a point y that has exactly the right adjacencies. All right, well, if you take a point y, the chance that it has exactly the right uh, uh, adjacencies, the worst case, since p is less than or equal to a half, is to make it adjacent to all of them. So then the chance that it had all the correct adjacencies would be p to the u. That's a positive constant. That's a positive constant. So the chance that the point is, the probability that the point is a witness is at least p to the u. And the chance that it's not a witness is 1 minus p to the u. But observe that if you look at points y1, y2, y3, dot, 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 being a witness, those are mutually independent events because they're involved, they involve different edges. So y being a witness, you're looking at the edges from y to x1 through, through xu. And z being a witness, you're looking at z to x1 through x10. So they're mutually independent. And so you take it to the n minus u power. But u is fixed. This is polynomial growth. This is a constant. This is exponential decay. Exponential decay is stronger than polynomial growth, so it goes to zero. OK, so that's, now we're going to use that. But that's just interesting by itself, that for fixed u and for p fixed and u fixed, as n goes to infinity, you're going to have the u extension property. Now I give duplicator strategy. He just duplicates. That's all he does. He never gets stuck. Because as, as long as you have the t, if you have the t minus 1 extension property, remember, he, the number of rounds is arbitrary, but it's fixed. So you have the t minus 1 extension property, so you go along. Here, say, the last round. Here at t minus 1, here at t minus 1. Duplicator goes over here. He looks at what the edges are, and he goes over here, and he, he finds the witness. So an easy strategy. It's not always that easy. It's not always that easy. So duplicator wins with probability approaching 1. And therefore, we have this, this amazing result by uh, Glebsky, Kogan, Lyaganki and Talinov, and, and later by Fagan. There are actually other proofs that use Gerdel completeness theorem. There, there are a number of ways to prove it, but uh, since I like combinatorics and probability, uh, this, is, this is the way I like to prove it. This is the way.
I like to prove it. So now I want to tell you something about my theorem. Well, OK. When, when, when this theorem was proved, they, they said, oh, well, we did all the cases. I mean, p can be an arbitrary constant. But you know, if you work with graphs, you, you, with random graphs, p constant is, is only one case. Usually, you're interested in, in p equals n to the minus 1 half, or p equals log n over n, or p equals c over n. You're interested in p as a function of n. So actually, so this is where I must say this is one of my best ideas. I thought, well, what about when p is a function of n? Well, you know that p equals 1 over n doesn't work because that's when triangles are created. And, and you know that, that n to the minus 2 thirds doesn't work because that's when um, you get uh, complete graphs on four points. And you know that log n over n doesn't work because that's when you, after that, you don't have any, uh, that's, that's when isolated points disappear. You can't talk about connectivity, that's not first order. But if you look at the statement that there's an isolated point, log over n over n is what Erdős and Rainey called the threshold function. So if you're at a threshold function, well, then you're not going to get a 0, 1 law. Now, people had been working ever since Erdős and Rainey in 1960, people had been working at this point for 25 years and had found many, many threshold functions. And all the threshold functions had rational powers of n, n to the minus 2 thirds, n to the minus 5 sevenths, n to the minus 1, maybe times a logarithmic term. So I made the conjecture, which then became the theorem, I'll restrict to, to 0, 1, otherwise it's much easier. And suppose that alpha is irrational, an irrational number from 0 to 1, then there's a 0, 1 law. So if alpha is irrational, there's a 0, 1 law. I should emphasize, to have a 0, 1 law, means that things are boring. Nothing's happening. Either something's true or it's false. That's boring. You know, you like life to happen with probability of half. Life's much more exciting when it, the probabilities aren't zero or one, right? I mean, you, you don't want to know absolutely what's going to happen. So, so to say, when people ask, well, what's so important about alpha being irrational? It's really what's so unimportant about alpha being irrational. When, when alpha is irrational, n to the minus alpha is a boring function where nothing interesting is happening. That's the way to think about it. But of course, we needed to prove it. And the pro so I'm going to take as an example pi over 7, just because. Uh, it has no interesting properties, but I mean, there's nothing about pi. I could take any irrational number you want would be uh, good. And uh, OK. And, and this will be my example uh, for to outline the argument. The strategy I gave before doesn't work. And here's why it doesn't work. Take three points. Do they have a common neighbor? Well, if there are three random points, then they're n possible neighbors. But the probability that you have the three adjacencies is, is p cubed 
which would be n to the minus 1.3. So with three random points, the expected number of neighbors is going to zero, so the probability that they have a common neighbor is going to zero. So most triples do not have a common neighbor. But some triples have a common neighbor. After all, take a point, it has high degree, take three of its neighbors, they have a common neighbor. So here's where duplicator has to be careful. So suppose you're playing the four-move Ehrenfreud game, and, Aaron, and uh, Spoiler goes, oh, I'll take this one, this one, this one, and Duplicator says, oh, all right, I'll take this one. Aha! You made a mistake because, look, here's a point joint to the, and your point doesn't have those. So you lost, you know. So, so duplicator, duplicator has to look ahead. Duplicator has to see what possible things are coming, okay? And to do that, we need to know which things are likely. So, I mean, if, if, if Spoiler had picked two points and then taken a common neighbor, but in this range, every pair of points has a common neighbor. So that wouldn't be an unusual thing. So what we do is we look at different kinds of extensions, and this represents two points having a common neighbor. So this has, we let V be the number of points that are not in the base, and E be the number of edges. And here V is 1 and E is 3. And here V minus alpha E is greater than 0. And that means that pairs of points will have a neighbor. In fact, one can show that every pair of points will have a neighbor. But here, V minus alpha E is less than 0, which means that a random three points will not have a neighbor. Why is it V minus alpha E? Because you've got n to the V choices for, for this. Here you only have one point. But let me give another example. I wrote down another example. Here's a more complicated example. So here V equals 3. We don't count the points on the bottom. And E equals 9. So most choices of six points will not have such an extension. But there will be, or might be, in fact in this case will be, some choices of six points that do have this extension. And so the duplicator has to see whether spoilers an adversary when he's picked those six points, do they have this extension or not? Yeah. So this, these extensions are called dense. These are called sparse. There's actually you don't just look at V minus alpha E. There's a notion of rigid. So let me just say, for example, to define rigidity, No, sorry. There's actually a technical definition of, of an extension being rigid, which means that every part of it is rigid. So 
this extension is not rigid because going to this point is dense, but then this point is kind of free. And, and similar, all right, so also there's a technical definition of uh, safe. Okay. And now, I want to define a closure in the graph. And this is what, what duplicator is going to look at. And it has a parameter u, which is an integer. And we want to look at the u closure of a set. And the set will actually be the, the positions already played by, by one of the players. So you take the set s. Let me just take this example. So here's the set s. And you look at all rigid extensions with at most u points. So you, you don't look at rigid extensions with an arbitrary number of points. You look at rigid extensions with at most u points. Let me take u equals 1. So there's only one rigid extension with one point, and that's a point joined to all three of them. So, but now the one closure, you can add a point that's adjacent to three of them, but you can keep on going. So what you can do, I mean, it might, there might not be any, but you can take this point joined to these three, and maybe this point joined to these three, and maybe this point also joined to these three, and then maybe you have this point joined to these three, and now maybe you have this point joined to these three. And you just keep on going. You keep on going. So that's what I mean by the T closure. So you have the notion of a rigid extension. And you just keep making rigid extensions. Now maybe there aren't any. In fact, if you pick random points, the, the closure will just be the set itself. There won't be any extensions. But you keep going and going until there are no more, and then you have to stop. Okay, And that's called the t-closure of the set. I think I'll just keep with, with this example. And a key lemma. is the bounded closure lemma, which says that these closures will be bounded in size, which is to say That is like looking at this picture. In fact, I'll, I'll just do it with this picture. I'll tell you that, that the, um, the size of the one closure of five points is bounded by 50 or whatever. But that 50 is a constant. It only depends on the size of s. Here it's 5. And uh, the t for the t closure, well, Oh, sorry, I called it u-closure. So here it's 1. And it depends on the value of alpha. It depends on the value of alpha. So why is that the case? But let's just do it with this picture. Could we have this picture with, with 5,000 vertices? No. I claim you can't because each extension
for each extension, you're adding one vertex and three edges. And because it's dense, v minus 3e is negative. But there are only a finite number of possible values of v minus 3e. I mean, in this case, v minus 3e is v minus 3e. But if it was the, the five closure, there might be 11 possibilities. But they'd all be negative, so they'd be a most negative. So this is less than or equal to minus 3, minus theta. So it's not only is it negative, in fact, actually, in this case, we can calculate what it is. It's, it's, it's theta is, is 0.32 or so. Okay. But if there were 10 possible extensions, you take the minimum of all the thetas that you got there. Okay. So here it's, it's, it's minus theta. So suppose, so suppose that closure of S was, had size 3 plus L, well, there'd be only a finite number of pictures. So we just have to look at any particular picture. And in any particular picture, would have N to the 3 plus L. So, well, let me write it. So let, in the picture, let V be the total number of vertices, and let E be the total number of edges. And so V minus 3E is less than or equal to minus theta V. And so what we get is N to the 3 plus, sorry, N to the 5 plus L, because they're five, the 5 is, is the size of S. So we get N to the 5 plus L times P to the 3L, but n times p cubed is n to the minus theta. So this is less than or equal, in fact, in this case, it's equal to n to the 5. And each time we make an extension, we're losing, we're losing theta. So not only is it negative, but it's bounded away from 0. It's bounded away from 0. So now if we take L equal 100, in fact, actually, uh, we could, it's not 100, whatever. You just pick L so that 5 minus theta L is negative, and that's it. And so the, the, uh, the, the size of the one closure of every five-point graph is smaller than 100 because you just wouldn't have the graphs that you would get. So, so that's it. And I can now at least describe the strategy, the nature of the strategy. I really don't mean much greater. These are actually given by specific formulas. There are numbers a1 through, through, through at such that after x1 through xi and y1 through yi are selected, the a sub i closures of the x's have 
has to be the same as the A sub I closures of the Ys. So this is just the, the outline of it. Um, but this is the, the nature of the strategy. The A's are given by, in a somewhat complicated way, but they're given in a, in a specific way in terms of uh, the, the number alpha, in terms of the number alpha. So we find a sequence of A's. And surprisingly, surprisingly, it, it's, you'd think that with T moves to go, you'd only have to look at the T minus 1 closure. It turns out not to be true. It turns out not to be true. Sometimes you have to look at a, a, a very big closure. And, and this is where, the, and there's a lot of interesting number theory involved in this. A lot of very interesting uh, stuff uh, in, this, in this argument. But I think, I think rather than, than give the argument, let me uh, finish the lecture with some work in progress with, with Maxim, uh, I should pronounce his name right, Zulowski? Zhukovsky. Well, I got the first letter right. Zhukovsky and his student. Uh, so we were talking about this. So let me finish with some open work that we're, we're looking at. Suppose now that we fix the number of moves k in the Ehrenfeucht game, which is the same as, as fixing the, the depth, you know, or upper bound on the depth of the first order statement. And now we want to look at, at what alpha things work and what alpha they don't work. So I'm going to define, and I'm, I'm thinking, I think in his talk on Friday, he gave a complete answer for k equals 4, but I want to think of k being large but fixed, OK? And I want to let define the spectrum S, but I'll define it in terms of its complement. Oh, one, one thing more. In the argument for n to the minus alpha, it not only works if p is n to the minus alpha, but there's a, a window around, for a given first order statement, there's a window around n to the minus alpha where it still works. That is, there's an epsilon so that if p is between n to the minus alpha plus epsilon and n to the minus alpha minus epsilon, that sentence a still has the same limiting probability. And that actually follows from this proof. That epsilon depends on the first order statement a. OK, let me, let me define the, a, a spectrum, really, by its, um, so let me define it in, in two ways. The first way is that you have a 0, 1 law for any sentence A of quantifier depth at most k. And when I say approach is 0 or 1, I mean there's a choice of 0 or 1 so that it works for any p of n in this range. So that's the first thing. But, and then the second thing that's equivalent to it is um, that there exists an epsilon such that, again, Little n and big N are the same here. So that if we take a random graph with edge probability near p to the n, 
then uh, the limit, no, then, sorry. So suppose, and similarly, GM is independent. An independent choice, then duplicator wins on G N G M for K moves. So we're restricting ourselves. We, we, we take K equals 100, and we say, OK, uh, the, when do we have the 0, 1 law when K equals 100? Now, this turns out to be uh, quite a complicated uh, question. Um, but there are different regions So roughly speaking, the, the points on the spectrum are the points where the zero one law does not hold. That's a, a little bit rough, and this is this is the definition. So here's zero, here's one. We're not interested in alpha bigger than one. Those are much easier. The graph n to the minus alpha when alpha is bigger than one, the graph just breaks up into little trees, and it, it, it's much easier. But we're interested in alpha between 0 and 1. And we're saying, uh, what are the critical exponents? What are the critical exponents? And the thing that I've suggested that we look at carefully, actually, Maxim has, has a lot of results when alpha is near 1. And I'd sort of like to look in this region where alpha is near zero. So let me at least tell you the first result. The first point in the spectrum is 1 over k minus 1. Now why is that? If, if you look at the, the uh, Glebsky, Kogan, 25 years, you'd think I'd know the names. <laughs> Klebsky, Colin, Kogan, X and Y, and Fagan. If you, if you look at that result, you'll see that suppose that, that alpha's less than 1 over k minus 1, and p is around n to the minus alpha, and you're playing the k move Ehrenfeucht game, you still have the extension property. So you still, you, you only need the extension property after somebody's played k minus 1. The hardest thing is you need that for every k minus 1 points, there's a point adjacent to all of them. Um, but if you take k minus 1 points, there are n possible points. And then the probability is p to the k minus 1 that they're all adjacent. So if alpha is less than 1 over k minus 1, then the, the number of witnesses will be a positive power of, uh, of n. And furthermore, you can show that there always is a witness. So um, in the region from 0 to 1 over k minus 1, there, there is a 0, 1 law. So that's not in the spectrum. And here. The 0, 1 law fails, and the state, look at the statement that every k minus 1 points have a neighbor. If, if, you're, if, if p is a little bit smaller, remember p gets smaller as you go this way. p is n to the minus alpha. It's always easy confusion. If you're over here and p is a little bit smaller, then every k minus 1 points, no, sorry, if you're over here, and p is a little bit bigger, 
then every k minus 1 points will have a neighbor. But if you're over here, in fact, most sets of k minus 1 points will not have a neighbor. So if you look at the statement, every k minus 1 points have a neighbor, then uh, it fails at 1 over k minus 1. Any distance to the left, it's true. Any distance to the right, it's false. Um, so that's the first point. And the next point looks to be uh, 2 over 2k minus 3. Maybe it's better to write it 1 over k minus 3 halves. And this is the property that for every choice of k minus 2 points, you have two points that are joined to themselves and join to all the others. So if you look at the expected number of these, you'd have n square, and then you'd have 2k minus 3 edges, so you'd have n to the minus alpha times 2k minus 3. So what happens is, if the edge probability is smaller than that, then you're not going to have that every k minus 2 points have these two points. So the extension property is that every k minus 2 points, there exists two points joined to each other and joined to all k minus 2. If p is a little bit smaller than this exponent, then the expected number of pairs of points is going to 0. So if you pick random points, it won't happen. If p is a little bit on the other side, the expected number of such pair of points is a positive power of n. And in fact, one can show that, that for every choice of the k minus 2 points, you, you will have these two points. So the second point is 2 over 2k minus 3. Third point, fourth point, fifth point, sixth point, seventh point. Well, I've had a wonderful time uh, here in Moscow, and I should say also in, in Irkutsk, uh, with the mathematicians there. So as I, I said in the beginning, you know, I've, I've wanted to come to, uh, to Moscow. I didn't know about Irkutsk. But I wanted to come to Moscow for at least, uh, the lower bound is 30 years. The lower bound is 30 years. So, so certainly since before you were born. Um, you know, certainly, Not you, but <laughs> the others. <laughs> uh, and so it, it's just been uh, wonderful. And I'm so pleased to get to uh, talk to people here. There's just a lot of wonderful mathematics uh, being done here. And so, uh, spasiba. Thank you.